uh, which is introduction to interactive proofs. Okay. Uh, oh, there is one a particular kind of proofs. Uh, right. <clears throat> so there is a question uh, uh, that will there be printed lecture notes. So there will be, uh, unless we forget a PDF of the slides before the lecture, uh, um, uh, but now I see somebody maybe can't hear us. <laughs> I'll address Can you hear us? The, there will be PDF of slides um, um, before the lecture. Uh, today I forgot, sorry, but generally we'll be posting slides before each lecture and they'll be available in that Google Drive folder that is linked from the general file. And we also have some lecture notes that are not quite posted, but I'll add them later today. Uh, they're a bit more detailed, but you will generally be fine with slides and recitation. Now, let me try to figure out why I can't hear anything. Can somebody say something and I can check whether I can hear? Hello? Yeah, and indeed I can't hear, go figure. Uh, what's going on? Before the mic gave up on me, now the speaker. Can somebody try to speak again? Hello again. Hmm, doesn't work. What's going on? Let's try again. Can somebody say something? Hello. Mm, this is frustrating. Let me see. I'm just, I'm just pull up some YouTube video and see if. Uh, I can hear anything locally uh, and just a sec. Can somebody try again to speak? Something. Great, I can hear now. All right. First, apologies to everybody who spoke so far. <laughs> I, I did not, I, I hope there weren't too many. Uh, you know, the computer was not on mute. Uh, I, I don't know what was happening. Uh, I'm, you know, a bit older, but not that, I mean, I, I'm not sure, not sure what was happening. So are there any questions uh, that the, I, were on the stack of the, the audio stack? Yeah. No, all right. Okay. Uh, and please, you know, generally speaking, if some, something doesn't seem like it's working, uh, like my audio, please, like, you know, at least the chat is working, so I will see it there. All right, so let's get started. So in order to talk about interactive proofs, which is a generalization of a standard notion of mathematical proofs, uh, we need to first agree on how do we think of the traditional mathematical proofs. And this is like a fairly kind of standard perspective in computer science, but um, it's helpful to kind of go through it uh, uh, carefully. And specifically what I wanna explain in the slide is why the complexity class NP can be viewed as traditional mathematical proofs. So first let's recall the standard definition of NP. Uh, so a language is in the complexity class NP if there is a polynomial time decider D, okay? Such that for every instance in the language, there is some witness that makes the decider say yes. And for every instance not in the language, regardless of which witness you bring to the decider, the decider will say no, okay? With yes being one and no being zero, okay? And an example, like a classical example is the language of satisfiable Boolean formulas where the instance X would be specification of the Boolean formula. A candidate witness would be a, an assignment that claims to satisfy the Boolean formula. And the decider will simply check whether the given witness, the assignment satisfies the instance, the Boolean formula, okay? We just checks this computation. Why is it polynomial time? Because evaluating a Boolean formula is a polynomial time operation. All right, great. Now, 
without really changing any definition, we can just rename things in English. Instead of call, yeah. Uh, are there any slides rolling? Because we see only the first, like the first clause for any instance X. Oh, now it's popped up. More. <laughs> Today, I don't know which pixie got a hold of my computer, but uh, uh, um, maybe, you know, the one thing that I didn't do today that I thought wasn't uh, going to help was to restart completely my computer. Maybe that's the thing that I, I should do next time too. Uh, all right, is it fine now? You, you, everything is fine, right? It seems fine. Yeah. All right. So, okay. So I just went through the, uh, uh, the example of a satisfiable formula. Um, and uh, uh, okay. So, so now I want to so reinterpret the class NP through mathematical proofs. And we're just going to keep the definition the same. We're just going to change some of the terminology to be more suggestive. Okay. So rather than the decider being called D, we're gonna have a verifier V. And say, okay, fine, that's just, you know, we just change the letter and call it to something else, right? Rather than saying an instance, we're gonna say a theorem, okay? And instead of a witness, we're gonna call it a proof and we're gonna suggestively call it pi, right, for proof. And this condition that if X is in the language, there's a witness for it. It's like saying, if a theorem is true, then there's a proof for it. This is something called completeness, okay? Two theorems have valid proofs. Okay, and again, the definition is the same. I'm just changing the terminology and the symbols to be suggestive. Ditto for the second condition that if before we're saying instances not in language don't have good valid witnesses, here we're saying false theorems do not have valid proofs, and this is something called soundness. Okay, and completeness and soundness is going to be this recurring theme through all notions of proofs. And this is in some sense what makes a proof system a proof system, that you can prove valid theorems and not prove invalid theorems or prove true theorems and not prove false ones with some notion of, of proving, okay? But otherwise, this is basically the way we conceptualize mathematical proofs. You have some theorem and you're wondering, hmm, is there some way to exhibit a proof such that there is some decision procedure that I can run through to establish whether I should be happy or not? And if there is some proof that demonstrates the theorem, then that's a true true theorem. If no proof will do, then that's not a true theorem, okay? And what is this, this verifier for mathematical proofs? Well, you can think about it as some axiomatic system, okay? Like, I don't know, either piano arithmetic or, a, 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 or set theory, whatever it is, right? So just some theory, okay? Um, and of course, you know, you want the, the decision procedure to be efficient, right? Uh, uh, so that uh, like the, the inference rules and all those things are things you can actually do from one line to the next. That's why you want this to be put on the time. Great. So hopefully I've convinced you that standard mathematical proofs are precisely the complexity class NP. And you can somehow view, view them as some non-interactive proofs, right? The prover spits out a proof and the verifier just reads it and is either convinced or not, right? And a revolutionary idea that somehow took a very long time for anybody to really formulate uh, precisely was the idea that maybe what if we give additional resources to the verifier such as randomness and interaction? And we're gonna talk about this in the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> so I wanna ad uh, address uh, Amit's uh, uh, great question. He's talking about, uh, well, traditional mathematical proofs do not have a kind of a, a length restrictions. I would say kind of yes and no. Like on the one hand, a, every given theorem in mathematics has like finite size. So in some sense, you don't really have asymptotics. So that's one of the reasons length doesn't come up, right? But let's say that you did consider their symbolics, okay? Some sort of sequence of theorems tending to infinity, infinity and you do not pay attention to the proof length. One, one idea of a mathematical proof, proof we, for example, tuple to enumerate, a, the echo came back. How did, how did they come back? <laughs> Look, I, I'm, I am on uh, earphones on the mic. Uh, and my, my computer is, uh, so can I, so the, uh, so the echo back, right? 
Damn. Try again. Again. How about still no? Very frustrating. Okay, I guess I'll detach and reattach my. How about now? Yeah, better. Great. Okay. Thank. Okay. Well, I guess uh, for now the solution is to to detach, reattach the the. Things, uh... Actually, no. Actually, no. It's back. I'm sorry. Mm. Yeah, I have I have egg uh, on uh, on the on the on the earbuds. Got nothing on my computer. Um, that is odd. Odd. It's truly really really. Weird. Let me go. I honestly don't know what's going on. I suspect that uh, I should have restarted my computer, but uh, short of that, everything looks looks legit now. Um, somebody says it's Seems better. like the echo's gone for some reason. Like I, I don't feel it anymore at least. Okay. Again, sorry about that. Uh, usually this is not the way things uh, uh, run here. Um, about asymptotics, right? So if you don't pay attention to the length of a proof, for example, you could imagine a proof that uh, lists every possible potential proof up to a certain length. That would have exponential length, right? But you know, nobody would call that as a mathematical proof, right? So here's another proof for a true theorem. Prove it yourself. I, I really mean it, right? Like, because you could have an algorithm that tries all proofs and holds, you know, when it finds the correct one, right? So like some, even though mathematicians don't encode this in mathematical proofs, it really is there in the background, right? The only reason why they didn't articulate it is because usually they look at a specific theorem of a finite size. But the moment you start thinking about asymptotics, like it truly doesn't make sense to have mathematical proofs that don't have polynomial size because you just won't be able to read them and you can write silly proofs such as, I went on vacation, go find the proof yourself, right? And that will take maybe exponential time, but th that could potentially be a valid proof without restrictions on resources, right? Uh, so in order for you to kind of do something it has to be that sort of the verification procedure is efficient. In order to be efficient, the input to the verification procedure has to be an efficient size, okay? Uh, so there's a question about if captures, if MP captures mathematical proofs, uh, why do we want to give more power? Well, it's a good question. We'll see, right? So mathematical proofs capture MP, but they will have a number of limitations and we'll kind of go through, we'll see a number of things that we can do with non-traditional like non uh, proofs that we do not know how to do or is, we can prove is impossible to do with mathematical proofs. So let's define this notion of interactive proofs and then we'll see um, something interesting. The, we have one construction we'll get to today that uh, is, uh, will hopefully you know, illustrate uh, uh, something that it's not clear how to do with the mathematical proof. Let's first try to define the model, okay? So we have now the prover and the verifier. And if before the verifier was just a polynomial time machine, now it is a probabilistic polynomial time machine. It is given random coins on some tape, okay? Which can read from. In addition, not only can receive messages to the, from the prover, it can exchange messages with the prover until it gets tired and it outputs yes or no. Okay, or no or yes. And so an interactive proof for a language L syntactically is a pair consisting of the prescribed prover algorithm and the prescribed verifier algorithm that satisfies two properties. Okay, now for now, the Prescribed honest prover, we will not put any efficient efficiency restrictions on it. We'll you know, talk about you know, why that later. But crucially, we want the verifier to be efficient. Just like for an NP, we want the, the decider or verifier to be efficient. And we have two properties. One is completeness that just says true theorems have proofs. 
Now, in this case, half proofs simply means that if I take the prescribed prover algorithm and I tell him, hey, look, please go ahead and prove to the verifier that the theorem X, which is true, you know, is indeed true. And we have this angle bracket notation that is often used in computer science, theoretical computer science, to denote an interaction between these two algorithms that says the probability that P on input X when interacting with the V on input X with randomness R, and we're taking randomness over the verifier's randomness, the probability that this interaction leads to the verifier outputting the, being convinced, outputting one, is itself one, okay? So we're saying that because X is an L, the prover algorithm is able to exchange messages in such a way that this algorithm will output yes with probability one, okay? This is completeness. So soundness, says that if X is not an L, namely if we have a false theorem, then not only the honest prover, but any prover, right? This is analogous to saying there is no proof that makes the verifier accept in the soundness case. Here we're saying there is no malicious interactive prover such that it makes the verifier accept with more than you know, some bounded probability, let's say half, right? By the way, half is not a very small probability. What would you do if you wanted a very small probability here? Repeat. You just run it again, right? And you know, each time you run this procedure, you have a half probability, at least half probability of rejecting, right? So you run it once, twice, three times, and this kind of acceptance, the probability you accept across all of these repetitions will decay exponentially. So you run it a hundred times in sequence, it means that the probability that you, that you accept in all of them is at most two to the minus 100, which is truly small, okay? So this error we can control and primarily, you know, this is here as just some standard kind of representative error, but know that you can just, because you have, with each fresh run, you have this probability, you can just run it a bunch of times, right? So you can gain whatever confidence you want by running this algorithm multiple times, this interaction multiple times. But the key point here is that we're saying for every malicious prover, including ones that have no bounds in any power, Okay, they are, maybe they have, they receive message B1 and to decide what to send for A2, they make an exponential length computation and then they send A2, okay? That's okay, we'll have, we'll have to protect against those provers as well, okay? So it is like an information theoretic guarantee on every possible prover strategy, okay? And these are completeness condition and the soundness condition. Because here it says specifically equals one, this is something that we call sometimes perfect completeness we'll sometimes consider situations where we have an error here and an error here. So can some small error on, on completeness, some error on soundness, but usually this is going to be perfect completeness that the verifier is always convinced in the good case. Okay. Now, uh, if you really wanna turn this in definition to be like absolutely like super mathematical, the one thing that is missing here is defining precisely what is an interactive algorithm, okay? And, you know, we won't do it here because this is more like the, you know, the, the goal of like a um, course in complexity theory, but the underlying mathematical model that you may want to look up in case you're skeptical about how these things can be defined would be an interactive Turing machine. Okay, so this would be an interactive Turing machine, an interactive Turing machine, they will have shared tapes and will be, they will have separate heads writing on messages and they will be exchanging and that's how it can be fully modeled as a sort of like, uh, like something that, you know, fully defined, okay? Uh, <clears throat> uh, so there is some discussion about uh, uh, maybe my lags. So, you know, I bought an external CPU <laughs> uh, to precisely drive my large screen and the recordings. And in my last course, which I kind of ran online, the, C the external GPU was like plenty fine on, uh, 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 on whatever I'm running right now. I don't know what's going on. Uh, yeah, anyways, any questions about the definition of interactive proof? And also there is a chance that you might be speaking and I'm not hearing you. So. No, no, there are no questions, I think. It could be, um, if I may. And I'm not hearing Bogdan, oh. Jesus. Today is a just total mishap, man. 
try again, please. Can you hear us? No. Test, test, test. Ooh. I'm getting pretty annoyed. Let's try again. Test, test, test. Oh, so maybe if, if you can hear me, I probably can't, can't hear it now and we should just keep continuing and I'll just look in chat. In chat. Sorry, uh, I'll try to sort this out in between. Um, does, does it have to be computable? Uh, no, it doesn't even have to be uh, um, computable. Um, it's okay if it's just, just function. Um, uh, and the echo is, echo is back, uh, just for, for key kicks. Um, I, guess, I guess attach and reattach. Can people hear me? Great. Yes. I can hear you too. Wow, wow. Um, um, yeah, yeah. So, so for Michael's question regarding the difference between computable and arbitrary, typically, typically defined with respect to interactive Turing machines that have unbounded resources. So in some sense, you know, you know, the model is, uh, is uh, I mean, says computable. At the same time, you know, you know, the secure the for I would say. Any interactive tip proof would actually write down. It doesn't really matter whether whether an algorithm computing the next message or not. It's just something. something. Uh, it's okay if it's a function. Um, we have an example, and you will see. You will see. It doesn't really matter, really matter whether it's, there is there is reason algorithm that can compute it in, in resources. Um, all right. Any further questions about uh, definition? Because now we'll kind of look at an example. Okay, so we'll continue. Um, right. Oh, I wanted to, to mention, you know, for those of you that uh, sort of familiar with sort of other nearby definitions, you can think of this like grid of adding interaction and randomness and <clears throat> kind of we define, we're gonna define the, the complexity class IP to be all languages that have interactive proofs according to this definition. Of course, if you remove interaction and randomness, you get the class NP um, if you just give me interaction, but no randomness, there is still a class NP, right? Because there's no point for the verifier to talk. I mean, the prover knows what the verifier is gonna say in each round. So you can just send all the messages in advance. Uh, there is this other setting where you can give me randomness, but not interaction. This is a class known as MA. We won't really discuss it much, but I'll just say that, you know, for a variety of reasons to do, I mean, to win complexity theory, it is believed to equal a 20 anyways. Um, under so-called de randomization assumption. So, so there's something special about interaction and randomness together that creates this very interesting class IP. And we'll start in the next few lectures, we'll be studying like this class, okay? All right. So now that we have this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this general definition, we should ask, okay, which languages have interactive proofs? Anything beyond NP. Of course, NP is just a special case. So we get all of that for free, but in a trivial sense, right? So here we're gonna uh, give one of the probably simplest and, and you know, I would say also beautiful, most beautiful examples of an interactive proof. And that is for a mathematical problem called graph non-isomorphism, okay? Uh, so for that, we need to define in sort of the relevant uh, notation. So let's say that we have two graphs on the same vertex set. So V, they just have potentially different edge sets, E0 and E1. And we're gonna define an equivalence relation between graphs uh, and denote it G0 equivalent G1 and say that they are isomorphic if there is a permutation that preserves the edge relation. So that if U and V are edges in the first graph, then pi of U and pi of V are edges in the second graph and vice versa, okay? Uh, and in such a case, if that's the case, we've write that if you apply pi to G0, you get G1, right? Because when you applied pi, you get things in G1. Right, so we can define the language of pairs of isomorphic graphs. This is called GI, and we can also define the language of pairs of graphs that are not isomorphic. 
Okay, these are two languages, GI and GNI. And here's two examples, right? So these two graphs are isomorphic. And how can you convince yourself of that? Well, we just follow the definition. You know, is there a permutation that preserves the edge relation? And you just need to find one that does, right? So for example, here's one. You could send the vertex one, you send it to one. You send the vertex two and you send it to two. So uh, three, you send it to two. And notice that the edge from one to three indeed is preserved in one to two, okay? Right? And for example, uh, uh, three was connected to five, right? Let's see where five goes, it goes to three. And indeed uh, three, which was two, two is connected to three, right here. So the, the edge three, five is here two, three, right? And you can just check that you know all the edges are, are 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 preserved, or you can just visually look at it and say, well, these are the same graph, just relabeled and kind of drawn in some different way, right? Here are two graphs that are not isomorphic. Uh, can anybody see a quick reason for why they are not isomorphic? In this case, exponential is very small, so I. Not there is no cycle of size three. And indeed, I'm not hearing you. Sorry, Michael. Can you please write in chat? I'll sort this out. Yeah, no triangle. Excellent. So there is a triangle in this graph, but there's no triangle in this other graph. And the, the if edge relations are preserved, then the, you would expect a triangle in both in both graphs, right? Uh, but in general, it is harder to see, right? In this one, you have this kind of counterexample to the isomorphism relation. But if I were to write some just like massive graph and uh, and I would ask you, you know, like, how, why are they not isomorphic? It wouldn't be clear, right? And in fact, the definition in some sense would suggest that you would have to consider and discard every possible permutation. And it seems to suggest that it might be hard in general to convince somebody else that two graphs are not isomorphic, okay? Because what would you do in general, okay? So, and indeed, sort of these properties basically say that, okay, GI is in the class NP because I can easily convince you that two graphs are isomorphic. GNI is the complement and therefore it sits in the complement class coin P. Neither of them are known to be in P. So we don't have deterministic algorithms in the running polynomial time or polistic algorithms that run in polynomial time to decide whether two graphs are isomorphic. So this is the, the it's an interesting candidate to try to build an interactive proof for, okay? So if we are just armed with mathematical proofs, we wouldn't necessarily know how to prove non-isomorphism relations. Yet, now we're going to see how graph non-isomorphism has an interactive proof, actually a very simple and beautiful one, okay? So I'm just gonna, Write, write it out and then we're gonna look at it and analyze it for completeness and soundness, all right? So you have two provers. The input X that they receive as common input in this case is a pair of graphs, G0 and G1. Both the prover and the verifier receive the description of the theorem as input. What the verifier does, well, notice it uses randomness. It samples a random bit, it samples a random permutation and it scrambles the graph GB. After scrambling the graph, it sends it to the prover and it says, hey prover, here's a scrambling of one of the two graphs at random. Now, remember the prover is interested to prove to the verifier that the two graphs are not isomorphic. So what the prover will do, it will figure out which graph H is isomorphic to, okay? And tell the verifier which one he thinks it is. So it sends the bit B tilde that it thinks H is isomorphic to, okay? It will say by sending B tilde, it says, I claim that H is isomorphic to G B tilde. And what the verifier will do, it will simply check whether the verifier guessed the correct bit, okay? All right. Now, this is a protocol, it is fully specified. Notice the verifier is efficient because it's not doing anything complicated. It samples some stuff, computes a permutation and checks a bit. The prover is doing some difficult computation, but it's the prover's problem and none of our concern right now. Our concern right now is to establish completeness and soundness. Okay, that, that, that is what it makes an interactive proof, that it has completeness and soundness. 
So completeness, we, what we want to prove is that if the two graphs are in the graph in, in the language GNI, namely they are not isomorphic, then the prescribed prover will make the verifier accept with probability one over the verifier's randomness. Okay, well, if the two graphs are not isomorphic, that means the two graphs sit in two disjoint equivalence classes, right? Because the graph isomorphism relation is a equivalence relation. It is symmetric, reflexive, and transitive. So it means that you can take the set of all graphs and partition it by equivalence relations. Because GB is not isomorphic to G1 minus B, when the verifier scrambles at random GB, it gets some graph H in this equivalence class, right? Okay, well, it means that the honest prover can figure out which one it is and just answer with that bit and that's it. And it will be right always because whether B equals zero or B equals one, H will be inside here and not inside here. And so the honest prover can just figure out what that B is information theoretically and just send it back, okay? So it always knows the answer. It has to work for it. That's fine. It's prover is a, you know, has a lot of power. It's fine, okay? But it can always convince the verifier, all right? Okay, but that's just completeness, right? If we just wanted to satisfy completeness, we could just make the verifier accept always, all right? The verifier needs to discern true theorems from false theorems. So we also have to prove soundness. If the two graphs are not not isomorphic, namely they are isomorphic, okay? Then it cannot be that any prover can convince the verifier, let's say with more than half probability. But if the two graphs are isomorphic, they are in the same equivalence class and whether like, you know, you randomize scramble one or scramble the other, you get the same random variable. It's a random graph in the equivalence class, okay? So what happens is that the random variable pi of GB is identical to the random variable pi of g1 minus b. Because, and, and therefore the graph h that is sent to the prover is statistically independent of the bit b, which is not sent to the prover, okay? So no matter what the prover does, the probability that b tilde equals b is exactly a half because h carries zero information about b. It is just a random graph in the isomorphism class of G0 and G1, period, okay? There's nothing the prover can do, you know? And we're not considering things like bribing the verifier to reveal B, the B to B, right? So <laughs> the prover just knows H, okay? Whatever is sent. So in the soundness case, we're exploiting the fact that when the two graphs are, are isomorphic, that's the kind of the not in the language case, H kind of hides the B to B and the prover is asked to guess the bit B. So it can guess it with probability half. Okay, that's just a secret random bit. All right. Any questions about completeness and soundness? This is like a beautiful toy example that illustrates in a very simple way what things you can do with interaction. Now, if you try to go back to mathematical proofs, it's really not clear what would you do. You cannot send me a proof of all the possible permutations. That's just inefficient. Yet here, a prover by sending one bit is able to convince the verifier that two graphs are not isomorphic with probability, you know, with a confidence half. And if the verifier doesn't like it, they just repeat this protocol 10 times. Now it has confidence two to the minus 10. Not happy enough, repeat it a thousand times, that two to the minus a thousand. But still it's an efficient protocol and you can convince of something that, you know, a priori might have required checking all possible permutations, okay? All right, so a couple of remarks. Well, first, now we have a first non-trivial example of an interactive proof, okay? We are ignoring the prover time and we will be ignoring the prover time for quite a few lectures. Our point right now is mostly to save job of the, save if you, I mean, to make the, to ensure the verifier remains efficient for example, in classical mathematical proofs, we don't worry about where the proof comes from. We just worry about verifying it. This is analogous, okay? We don't worry where the interaction comes from. We just care about there is an interaction that makes us accept with probability one, right? The honest prover. And finally, here it seems like we're secretly, we're really relying on the secrecy of the bit B. Turns out that this is not even necessary. There are like more complicated protocols where the verifier is fully public. It's so-called public coin protocols. 
and you can still do these things. So it's really just, just about randomness and interaction, but not secrecy. It's just secrecy sometimes help with simpler protocols. Uh, <clears throat> So um, th there were a couple of points. So one by Michael in chat. Uh, yeah, so I didn't get into it, but isomorphism can be decided in quasi polynomial time. So there are better ways than, um, um, than sending all the permutations, but still that's an inefficient algorithm. Um, <clears throat> all right, are there further questions? And if, if so, please write them because I probably can't hear you. Um, Okay, so can the prover, so there's one by, by Wilfred. <clears throat> to graphs. Yeah, so the prover has a strategy here, which is, say the prover is trying to win and he just sends a random bit. It can do it, but you know, that strategy will succeed with probability at most half. In fact, exactly half, right? Because the probability that if b tilde is random equals another random bit is still half, right? So. The point is that whether it tries to think, whether it tries to do things at random, it doesn't matter. We have proved that its success probability is bounded from above by a half. And this error, can, you can then drive it, drive it down by sequential repetition, right? Good question. More questions, and again, via chat, sorry about, uh, I'll fi figure out my, my, my setup by next time. Great, this, I encourage you to like, look at this offline. It's a very cute kind of toy example. We'll see much more complicated ones soon. Uh, uh, <clears throat> there's a, another question, you know, if the two graphs are, are, are not isomorphic, are we expecting the prover to be correct? Yes, that's what we proved in completeness, right? We proved that if they're not isomorphic, the honest prover can always give the right answer to the verifier and that is perfect completeness, right? Remember that we're proving GNI, not GI, right? We're trying to prove two graphs are not isomorphic, which means completeness is when the two graphs are not isomorphic. Sound is, soundness is when the two graphs are isomorphic. And the honest prover is not supposed to send a random bit. It's in the honest case for completeness, it will send the unique bit that corresponds to which graph H is isomorphic to, okay? So it is always right. It's not doing something at random in the honest case. Uh, so there's a question about, so th when, I, when I say this one is identical, I mean them as random variables, okay? So the random variable pi GB is a distribution on graphs and the random variable pi G1 minus B is also distribution on graphs and they're the same distribution. Okay, so whether you sample from here or from here, you get the same kind of distribution H. And uh, because of that, that sample carries no information about B. Okay. All right. All right. And yes, uh, Bogdan is pointing out that if, two, if you want to convince two graphs are isomorphic, we don't need to go to interactive proofs. We can just send the permutation. We'll see later in a few lectures, if you want to do it in zero knowledge, there are other things you want to do, you can do. But if you just want to convince it's an MP, just send the witness, send the proof of web membership. Okay, great. Now it's easy to get confused around completeness and soundness. Just do it systematically. Completeness means the honest prover for X in L, soundness means arbitrary prover for X not in L, okay? And just, just kind of uh, become familiar with it, it will become second nature, all right? <clears throat> all right, so uh, I'm not sure if Val has a question or it's uh, some abbreviation. Uh, um, any further questions before I move on? All right, so we just have one more thing that I wanna to do today. Uh, hopefully the technology will let me. Uh, <clears throat> and that is, I would like to talk about something that a limitation of interactive proofs, okay? So we'll spend the next few lectures building up capabilities and tools to construct interesting interactive proofs. But before we get there, it will be helpful to understand the definition better by actually like, proving a limitation. Like we're gonna prove that 
interactive proofs cannot be used to prove languages beyond P space. Okay? Now, just a reminder of what P space is. P space is the complexity class of languages decidable in polynomial space. So it's okay to use exponential time, that's fine, but you cannot use more than polynomial space, okay? And you know, many, I don't know, cute strategy games are P space complete, okay? I think maybe like uh, checkers, maybe that's uh, uh, deciding whether a, a, a player has a winning move in checkers, that, that should be P space complete, okay? So this type of kind of search search over exponentially many options with, while, while not storing all of them at the same time. That's roughly what P space is, okay? We're gonna prove that the in complexity class IP is contained in complexity class P space, okay? So how are we gonna prove it? Well, you give me a language in the complexity class IP, by virtue of being an IP, it has an interactive proof for it. So let it just call it P and V. That's an interactive proof per language L. We want to argue that because this language has an interactive proof, I can decide it in polynomial space. Namely, I can exhibit a polynomial space algorithm that decides whether X is in L or X is not in L, okay? That is tantamount to showing that L is in P space. And that would be proving this complexity inclusion, right? So before I continue, like, is it clear what we're trying to do? I wanna prove a limitation on interactive proofs, an upper bound on their power, and I'm saying, well, look, I don't know yet what the class of interactive proofs is. Just give me a language that is decided by one and I'll tell you how I design an algorithm to decide it that will have some bound on resources. And the bound is going to be not too much space. So we do not expect languages that require, let's say exponential space to be decided to have an interactive proof, okay? So for example, exp complete languages are unlikely to have interactive proofs, okay? So, Let's do that. Uh, and this is a pretty cute proof and we will kind of exercise the definition of interactive proof. So give me an instance and I, I can associate to each instance a maximum winning probability. That is the maximum probability that any prover will be able to convince the verifier on this instance, okay? I consider all possible provers, honest, dishonest, all of them. And I look at the highest probability of acceptance of the verifier across all provers. If X is in L, then I know that QX equals one because the honest prover will make the verifier accept with probability one. And if X is not in L, then I know that this quantity is at most a half because no matter which prover you write down, the verifier will accept with probability at most half, okay? So it suffices to compute the quantity QX in polynomial space because once I know that quantity, I can decide what to do with X. Do we agree? Okay, great. So now one problem you can say, okay, well, let's just kind of iterate over all provers. What's the problem? Well, I can't really expect to iterate over all provers because this includes provers that may require large space to simulate. And I don't have that space. I only have polynomial space, okay? So it is not an option for me if I want to run in polynomial space to just consider directly all possible provers. But I have something. And that something is that a transcript of interaction between the prover and the verifier, regardless of what the prover is doing in between, has polynomial size because the prover, I mean, the verifier has to read it, right? The, the communication transcript of messages between the prover and the verifier has polynomial size. The verifier runs in polynomial time. So it cannot entertain dialogues that require more than polynomial size, right? So we can afford to iterate over overall transcripts in the polynomial space. And at an extremely high level, this is why it's in polynomial space, but I'm gonna articulate this intuition more precisely for the sake of exercising the definition, okay? Uh, <clears throat> does max have to exist? Yes, because here we're saying that in the good case, that exists one prover, so that makes it one. So I have to find it, right? So I have to consider the best one. And in the malicious case, kind of, I have to make sure that there is no prover that is better than one over, one over two, right? So I really like, this is the maximum winning probability 
you know, that's, uh, define it like that. So there is a maximum, right? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, there's a question. So how does the honest verifier know that randomness he sends is random? Uh, um, well, the ver we give the randomness to the verifier. This is kind of given as a trusted resource. So the verifier looks to the left and there's a pile of random bits, okay? And it can feel free to use them. The it is not in the model to consider the setting where the verifier has access to, I don't know, high entropy source that is not random or something like that, right? So we're assuming the verifier has the capability to use randomness as a resource, okay? So it, if it uses randomness, it is randomness, okay? People can also study interactive proofs with like bad randomness, that's a different story, we won't talk about it, okay? And ditto for the interaction, you know, if the prover sends a message, the verifier will receive it. There's nobody in the middle taking the mail and throwing it in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in the side of the road, okay? So it's really like an like idealized model where there is this interaction, okay? Uh, <clears throat> It is a question about you know, why should it be at most half? Well, because that's what soundness says, right? Soundness says that no matter what you write down, when X is not an L, the probability that what, whatever the prover does, the verifier will accept the probability at most half, right? So it means that this quantity is at most half. Now, when the verifier rejects, it could be that the prover spoke in a different language and it was not part of the protocol, right? the verifier may reject. The prover may also try to insult the verifier and the verifier might get upset and reject, right? Those are all covered under the very verifier, verifier rejecting, okay? Whatever reason, we know by the definition that if X is an L, some prover will make the verifier accept the probability one and no prover will make the verifier accept the probability more than half, the end. Why did the verifier reject? Was it offended? Did it get tired of the conversation? It doesn't matter. That's what the definition says, okay? Hopefully I understood your question, Bogdan. All right, so our new goal is, will be wanna formalize this intuition that we can iterate over all transcripts and somehow compute this quantity. Uh, <clears throat> here's a question about uh, all functions or all computable functions. I'll, I'll keep it safe for myself and uh, talk about computable functions that we will actually do won't matter because we won't be paying attention to this max. We'll pay attention to the transcripts. We will show that there is a computable function that is optimal and we don't have to worry about uncomputable functions. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, so our strategy is that we're gonna prove that the optimal prover strategy is computable in polynomial space and therefore so is the probability QX, okay? And we're gonna explain this like in, in detail. So, let me try to say it again. We need to talk about partial transcripts. So a partial transcript is just a tuple of back and forth messages up to some round. So the prover sends something, the verifier sends something, the prover says something, verifier says something for some number of rounds i. That's a partial transcript. And we're going to define p star to be a function on the instance and a partial transcript that gives the best prover next message, okay? So it maximizes the convincing probability conditional interaction so far being this transcript, okay? It's well-defined, right? Because of all the messages that it couldn't send, there is one among them that is at least as good as any other message out of the, 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 the convincing probability condition of where we are now, okay? So that's P star, okay? I'm defining it to be the optimal function for next message for the prover. And I wanna claim that if the function P star is in P space, then QX is also in P space. And I'm using here, I mean, I'm, I'm overloading notation. When I say in P space, I don't mean that's a language that is in P space. I mean, there is a polynomial space algorithm to compute this function. And this one means there is a polynomial time algorithm to compute this quantity. Okay, so let's first prove this implication. It's pretty simple. If I could compute P star in polynomial space, how would I compute Q sub X, the maximum winning probability? Well, I would do it as follows. First, I would observe that 
the maximum winning probability is simply the fraction of accepting bits over all possible randomness of the verifier. So I take the, 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 I take the set big R to be all possible random choices of the verifier. And for each random choice, I define the bit BXR to be the decision of the verifier when interacting with the optimal strategy, right? QX is this ratio, right? Because QX is the best winning probability and the optimal prover certainly achieves that because it picks the best message at every round, right? So it suffices for me to be able to compute this quantity, okay? So for any fixed choice of randomness, I can, and I'm gonna argue that this bit is computable in polynomial space. How? Well, I want to figure out what is this bit. Okay, well, let's just play the game. I ask the optimal prover, what you send in the first message? Here it is. The verifier says something, okay, for this randomness. And then I tell the prover strategy, hey, I got B1, what do you say? Well, A2 star, great. What does the verifier say? B2, blah, 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 blah. And you continue, you have the whole interaction, right? And at the end, you know, you just know what the verifier accepts or not, right? So this determines whether this is zero or one. And because this one is in polynomial space, because I have assumed that P star is in polynomial space, each of these is in polynomial time because the verifier is efficient. Then I have, I know that this bit is in polynomial space. And then I can just iterate over all randomness in polynomial space, add up all of these things and divide them by the size of R and I'm done, right? Now, what is size of R? Yes, it is two to the power of randomness length, great. The input, so the verifier runs in polynomial time because it is polynomial in X, yeah? And yes, in this slide, we are assuming that P star is in polynomial space. We're not assuming it exists because I just defined it. So it, it does exist. This is a well-defined, it's a, it's a function that is well-defined, okay? So here I'm defining a function and here I'm saying it is computable in polynomial space. And the way the function is defined, it says at every round, pick any message that maximizes the residual winning probability, okay? Once I've defined this function, I'm saying if you can compute in polynomial space, then I can compute Q sub X in polynomial space as well. <clears throat> And if there is more than these, then just break ties lexicographically, okay? And there's just a well-defined way to, to pick among multiple messages that are equi-successful, okay? Uh, okay, there's maybe one question I didn't answer. Uh, we are given V, we are promised that V runs in polynomial time. Right now, we're not necessarily uh, 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 caring about in how much time, though we do need to know how large is its randomness that it's using because we're gonna have to divide by it, okay? But which is fine, it's okay. Just some polynomial function of the input. Um, the length. All right, so we're not done yet. Uh, we are left to prove that P star is in P space, but are we comfortable with what is P star and why if P star is in P space, then the maximum winning probability is in P space? It's like, it's pretty simple, right? It just says compute each decision bit for each possible randomness and kind of add them up. And by just looping all of these things, I don't really have to remember past computations. I just keep the tally and I'm just reusing polynomial amount of space for an exponential amount of time, right? Great. Any further written questions? And apologies if I missed some question earlier, I think I addressed all of them. Okay, I see people reasonably happy. Uh, are the restrictions on the size of R? R is just the randomness space of the verifier. It is just some polynomial, some two to the polynomial, okay? Because the verifier runs in polynomial time, it cannot use more than a polynomial amount of bits. So the size of R is at most two to the poly, okay? And uh, um, 
and yeah, like, you know, this is, you just add up all these things. You have, uh, this is going to be some fraction of R. And this, you know, you add them up, you get an integer, and you just, with integer arithmetic, you divide the numerator by the denominator as part of your algorithm. And that's, uh, you know, it's not the expensive part of the computation. The expensive part of the computation is iterating over all randomness, right? And, you know, potentially computing P star in each of those, okay? There's a question by Amit and, and say, yes, it says that if you want to do your best at your game, you don't need more than P space as a power, okay? There is no reason to consider uncomputable functions, for example. It suffices to consider algorithms that run in polynomial space and you will do as well as any other function, okay? Um, great, okay, but so why is the best function in P space? Well, you, you kind of get the hang of it, right? We're gonna have this all this sort of <laughs> search in a tree for the best option and then you know make your way up to know what is the best option now, right? Uh, and the whole point is that you don't need to remember like the whole tree which has exponential size. You just need to remember some metadata that you're aggregating to tell you what to do with this particular node, right, of the tree. So let's go and say that uh, we just have just a few minutes, which is enough. We're gonna argue that P star is in P space, okay? Which is the one thing that we haven't proved yet. Okay, the, the optimal prover strategy is in P space. So, <clears throat> so give me a transcript that is, you know, some partial transcript up to I rounds. Um, that's an input to the strategy and define R brackets X comma TR to be the set of strings, random strings of the verifier that are consistent with the input X and the partial transcript TR. Then a, we can define for, I mean, this is how is it consistent? It means that the B1 that is here is what's written here. The B2 that is there is what the verifier says on R, right? And so on and so forth. So, let's see. To be consistent means to satisfy these I conditions, all right? And the proof is by induction on I, right? With the simplest case being transcripts that are almost full, right? So if you have a transcript that is missing just one round, what would you say at the last round? Well, it's pretty simple. You just say, look, I don't really know what randomness the verifier has in its mind. I just know that it's consistent with the thing that I've seen so far. It will be one of those at random and I can just pick the best next message that maximizes the, the acceptance probability, right? And that is what I'm going to output, right? And so I've just basically unrolled and made more precise the definition of P star in this case. And why is it in polyspace? Because just iterate over all possible messages and randomness in this set and just see which one is doing best, okay? And why can I do it in polyspace? Because the messages I was sending have polynomial size and the sizes of randomnesses are in polynomial size. So I can just iterate over all of, all of them, okay? And at some point after a long time, but using small space, I will figure out what's the argmax of this function, right? And that is my best final message, okay? Now this is at the last round, right? In general, we can use induction and say, look, if I'm at some earlier round, let me assume that I have already, I mean, that I already know that P star on longer transcripts, it is in P space. Then what I'm going to do is like, I have some uh, a similar expression that says, okay, the best strategy for round uh, I plus one is the argmax of the expectation given that I do the best thing for all the other rounds that come after, right? Given that I, you know, this is what I send in the I plus first round, right? Uh, and here I have maybe some trans, some uh, index that uh, should be I plus two. Okay, let me just make a note that there's a typo here I'll fix later. All right. So I just need to pick the best one for this round, given that later I, I, I can already predict, given what has happened so far, what is going to be the best, the best message next, right? Because we already agreed 
improved by induction that uh, it's in polyspace. So to say it more precisely, so the, uh, there's a plus two here. So I just, I fixed it in the next slide on the previous one. So these are the optimal prover messages. And so what are the optimal prover messages? Well, I just play it right with the prover on the longer transcripts. And because this prover is on transcripts longer than I, by the inductive assumption, this can be done in polyspace, polyspace, polyspace. This is polytime, polytime, right? The whole thing is in polyspace. So it means that the inner, the inner predicate can be evaluated in polyspace. And then I can just iterate over this randomness and over that messages. And so the above is also computable in polyspace given these. And uh, then I can iterate over that and I'm done, right? So another way to say it is that you know, I'm just kind of inching my way up this kind of game tree, right? And each time I know that I'm in polyspace and to evaluate the parent, I'm gonna need to kind of evaluate all the sub, sub children, right? But that's okay because like, <laughs> I only, it's only to figure out the next best strategy. And I need to remember like much beyond the, sort of what was the best, the best one for that uh, choice up here, right? Uh, <clears throat> so there's another, another question about uh, bounds on, so how do I know that this message and this randomness are bounded? Because if, for example, they're bounded by the running time of the verifier, right? And there is some bound on the verifier. Maybe it is n to the 10, maybe it is like n to the 17. Doesn't matter, it exists. Just take it and construct this algorithm. And uh, uh, that's enough to construct a polyspace algorithm, right? We, we are not physically um, kind of going to implement it in the real world. We just need to argue such an algorithm exists, right? So whatever is the running time of the verifier, we just take it and we use that information to build this polyspace algorithm. And that just shows this algorithm exists, which is enough to show that the language is in p-space, right? Um, <clears throat> we're giving a one-to-one -one reduction. Uh, I'm not sure um, what you mean by that. All we're saying is that to the side whether X is an L or X is not an L, I can construct a polyspace algorithm that does it. And that is enough to show that uh, L is in p-space, right? There's, there's a universal algorithm A that uh, given X outputs whether X is an L or not an L and that algorithm runs in polyspace. That's all we're doing. And uh, that shows that the language L is in p-space. So this expectation. Um, right. So then there's a longer question. Let me just try to parse it. Do you hear me? Uh, hello. He doesn't hear us. You need to write in the chat. I see. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need to parse that question. Maybe. Uh, after, I mean, uh, um, after I stop. Uh, so <laughs> I'll get to your question, Bogdan, okay. Uh, any further uh, questions about you know, this, this argument? I know this one is about this argument, but maybe uh, other urgent ones. Okay, just to, um, uh, there's a question about, is this similar how we compute the best next move in chess or in a minimax fashion? It is similar, except that here, rather than having two strategic players that are kind of, one is trying to maximize utility and one is trying to minimize utility, the, you can think of the verifier as like a, uh, like a move by nature that is kind of prescribed, right? Like the verifier is a prescribed algorithm, it just does what it does, right? And the prover is playing against this specific algorithm, right? So the, this, this strategizing only happens on the prover front and it's trying to maximize its winning probability against that verifier. In two player games, usually you have this like mutual strategizing. That's why you have this kind of, for example, minimax uh, uh, features in these two player games. But the verifier is given, like it's like a public information what it's going to do. And it's just some random stuff at every round, okay? And the prover is just trying to maximize against that, okay? That's why here you have argmax and expectation rather than max and mean alternating in this tree. Okay, but it's certainly related to 
uh, uh, to games. Uh, uh, just you can think of maybe the verifier as like some sort of referee as opposed to like as an actual player. Um, um, So there's a question about what is verifier does not use the uniform distribution of the randomness. Well, that's not an honest verifier, right? So we trust the verifier to do the right thing and we are giving the verifier random bits. So that's all trusted, okay? If the verifier goes to sleep and is not paying attention, that's his problem, okay? The verifier has to be alert and follow the instructions in order to have satisfy completeness and soundness. Um, Um, okay, so I think there is a, there's like a lively discussion there. Let me maybe take a step back and uh, just uh, kind of recap, and then I'm going to stick around for questions, you know, as long as is needed. Okay. So, in terms of material today, what we did was we kind of saw the notion of mathematical proof as a re you know a re envisioning of NP, like as a reformulation of NP. We extended it to interactive proofs by adding interaction and randomness. We saw a simple example for graph non-isomorphism. Okay. So this pretty cute, you know, sort of one round protocol. And then we sort of went back and said, hey, you know, for example, we cannot prove the halting problem using interactive proofs because, you know, that's not something in P-space. Okay. Uh, we can only hope to prove things via interactive proofs that are in P-space. And, you know, as a spoiler, over the next two lectures, we'll work our way up to prove everything in P-space, but it will take some time uh, and, and introducing some pretty deep and interesting ideas on the way, okay? That's kind of what we did today. And I think this now is a, is a good time for me to stop the recording. <laughs>